have now. Okay, good. So I tend to videotape all my talks because 90% of them are total junk, but the 10% that are good, it's worth preserving. And, and I think actually everybody should be doing this because occasionally I go to a good talk, sorry, one in, one in five maybe, no? but, and, 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 and then I completely regret that, I, that, that it wasn't on video. Anyway, uh, so this is, I hope I will give more talks in Sydney in my two month here. Uh, so this is supposed to be very light. It's stuff that was on my mind 13 years ago and sort of evolved a little since then. Uh, but basically, 13 years ago, I decided I want to find some invariants in, of nodes that have some properties uh, because those properties would be useful. And, uh, and I've set out to, found them, to find them, and indeed I found them, and my further talks will be on that, on, 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 on the actual invariants. So uh, the next one will be about the technology that goes into it, not yet the invariant itself. And then if I have a third one, it will be the actual thing. Okay? Uh, so now it's just what I want, what I'm seeking. And um, let me tell you what is the basic point. So the basic point is that sort of uh, people tend to view knots as the top goal of knot theory. So you know, you need to separate knots, okay? Um, but, but somehow, um, the knots are the candies, and, and what you really should be studying is the ingredients uh, from which you assemble the knots, and, and the operations between the ingredients. And, uh, oh, sorry, I should have said that the top follows the handout, and I hope you're all, all holding a copy. Uh, if not, Boris, can you continue distributing the two yeah, main ones? Anyway, so the ingredients are tangles, and I want to say a little bit more about uh, tangles. Uh, maybe before that, also, let me make the analogy. Uh, so, you know, um, sort of in algebraic topology, you study homology. And homology is an invariant of spaces. So, if you want to prove that a surface of genus 7 is distinct from, a, is not homeomorphic to a surface of genus uh, eight, you compute the homology, you find that the homology is different and you've proven that they're distinct. But that's somehow the silly use of homology. The deeper use is the fact that homology is functorial and therefore uh, you can, uh, if you have related spaces, they have related homologies, so you can write diagrams like Sn minus one mapping into Bn mapping into Sn minus one and then put a diagonal here and oops, because of, 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 of uh, uh, functoriality, you've proven the Brouwer fixed point theorem. Uh, so, uh, similarly, I don't really care about um, knots, I, I, I care about tangles, and I care about invariants that will respect the operations between them. Okay? So, let me explain. So, a tangle, and this is the <coughs> first lie for this talk. So a tangle is a piece of a knot drawn in a part of the plane. So here is an example. The part of the plane is this orange square. You can see a piece of a knot here. It has four components. Component number one goes this way. Component number two goes this way, number three goes that way, well, and then there's also number four. Uh, and uh, I, the on, I'm only allowing components that are intervals. Some people uh, allow also components that are closed circles. To me, the components are never closed circles. They're only always open intervals. So in fact, it's not entirely clear how to include link theory inside the tangle theory. However, knot theory includes because knots are simply, you know, knots are usually knotted circles, but you can open them up and then you get a tangle with one component and in fact it's the same thing. It's, it's the, the two things are equivalent. So knot theory is included here even though link theory is, well, link theory is included too, but in a subtler way. Uh, the place where this is a lie is in that I really want virtual tangles, and I will not explain what they are. I will all, on, only occasionally tell you 
why little lies that I tell get cancelled against this lie. Okay? But, but you don't really lose anything but by not knowing anything about virtual tangles at this point. Anyway, what are the operations on, this tang on tangles? So there are two primary operations, and sorry, four primary operations, two of which are even more important. So one operation is, the is a binary operation, and it's a, a, if you have two tangles, T1 and T2, the result is a disjoint union, or more precisely, you take the two tangles and you place them in the plane side by side. Okay? And you can complain that this is slightly well, not well defined, because do you place T1 to the left and T2 to the right, or the other way around? Or maybe you want to place T1 between the legs of T2 right here. If I didn't specify it, it's not well defined. And uh, the answer is that it gets cancelled about the little, with the little lies that I told here. So just don't, just ignore it. It's not an important point. Okay? And, and then the second operation is called stitching. And stitching is the following. Suppose you have a tangle. A tangle has several components. I failed to tell you that I want, I want all the components to be named. So each component has a label which is a member of some finite set. Okay? So one component is A, the other component is B. A goes from here to here, B goes from here to here, and really here in between, inside, inside this thing, they are noted like the things over here on the left. Okay? Then there is the operation MABC called stitching, and it's a unary operation. It takes a single tangle and it outputs a single tangle, and the new single tangle that is obtained, you obtain by connecting the head of A to the tail of B outside of the mess. And you get, well, a tangle with, and, and renaming the resulting single component C. So you get a, a tangle with one component less, and it looks like this. Okay? And again, you can complain that there is a slight issue here, namely, what if the head of A is not adjacent to the tail of B? What do you do then? You have to choose how to go from the head of A to the tail of B, and the answer is that it cancels against the other line. Okay? And, it's not, and again, it's not a significant point. I want to state two things about uh, this operation. First of all, already now, the set of tangles is finitely presented. By the way, as an, as a, as an algebraic structure, knots are completely uninteresting. It's basically a set of distinct things. You can't do anything with them. Okay? Uh, but here, I mean, I didn't quite define the algebraic structure that appears here. But whatever the definition will be, it's clear that tangles are finitely generated, and in fact, they are finitely presented. So let me explain. So basically, the claim is that with these operations, you can construct any tangle you want. And the proof is a complete reality. If you want to construct a tangle, you draw all of its crossings in the plane. <coughs> You, take, you use the disjoint union in order to do that, so you only need the generators, which are a positive crossing and a negative crossing. And then you apply the stitching operation, stitch this to this, stitch this to this, stitch this to this, and clearly you can get whatever you want with these operations. So, so if, if later we will want to define an invariant of tangles, all we will need is to specify the value of the invariant on the two crossing, the positive crossing and the negative crossing, and how it behaves relative to these two operations. Okay, and I should say that there are two further operations. There is the delta ABC, which takes a strand labeled A and replace it, replaces it with two parallel couple, copies which I will name B and C. And then there is the strand reversal operation, S sub A, which takes a strand A and all it does is flips its order, re re reverses it. 
Okay, and I think it's clear what these operations all do. Okay? Uh, so the algebraic structure that all of these things together make is called a Metahopf algebra. And uh, basically this correspond the, the, the stitching operation corresponds to multiplication in a Hopf algebra. This corresponds to co-multiplication, but they're not quite multiplication and co-multiplication, for example, because multiplication is usually a binary operation, whereas the stitching is a unary operation. Okay, so, but it's like, they are neighbors, they are close to each other. And in fact, there are axioms, and one of the axioms is the meta-associativity axiom, which is, of course, neighboring to the associativity axiom of a Hopf algebra. And likewise, there is meta-co-associativity and several other axioms that are parallel to axioms, the axioms of the Hopf algebra. But let me just explain what's meta-associativity. So suppose you have a tangle with three strands, A, B, and C. So if I have a tangle, I hope you can see this because it's a bit dark. But anyway, if I have a tangle with three strands, A, uh, B, and uh, C, and of course I mean that they could be messed up together somewhere in between. Well, there are two ways I can connect all three of them. I can connect A to B and call the result X, and then, by the way, double slash means composition, composing from left to right. This just means composition. It's composition in the natural order as opposed to circle, which is composition done insane. Okay? So you call the result x, and then you follow it by stitching x to c, calling the result y. So you stitch x, now the whole thing here is called x, you stitch it to c and call the result y. And this is of course the same as first stitching b to c, calling the result x, so first you stitch this to calling the result x, and then you stitch a to it and call the result and call the overall result the result uh, y. So that's meta associativity, and it's one of the axioms. And likewise, there are some a few further ones. Okay, good. So one good thing about tangles with these operations is that it's finitely that they are finitely generated and in fact finitely presented. Uh, another good thing is that certain properties of knots can be expressed in this language, are algebraically definable in this language. And so, if you have an invariant that is well behaved with respect to these operations, it, is, it will potentially tell you something about these properties. Examples. So, every knot has a genus. Okay? So there is a, an old theorem of Seifert that every knot can be presented as the boundary of an embedded surface. And in fact, here is a picture. Uh, I hope you can see it. Maybe I can magnify it a bit. Can you see it, really? Maybe I'll magnify it. So basically, here is a, it's a, it's a statue see, uh, that, that you can see in Jerusalem somewhere. Uh, so basically, it's a knot here. Like you can see the, the edges and it's a knot, but, but it, it, it bounds a sort of huge metal surface. Okay? So anyway, the genus of a of a surface is the minimum the minimal genus of a surface whose boundary is that knot. Sorry, the genus of a knot is the minimal genus of a surface whose boundary is that knot. Uh, okay. Claim the knots of genus less than or equal to 2 are precisely the images of four component tangles via the operation shown here. So let me explain. Uh, so suppose you have a four component tangle, and let me insist that the, that the components will be organized in this way. So there are two pairs of two. And the input of, of, of the first one is here, the, the output is here, the input of the second one is here, the output is here, and likewise for the rest. But of course, in here, in T, uh, the, the, the components might be 
knotted with each other in any crazy way you want, okay? Then the operation T does the following. First of all, it doubles each one of these four. So this one becomes a pair, this one becomes a pair, another pair, another pair. Uh, it also, uh, so but again, sort of these pairs could still be knotted with each other in some crazy way, okay? And then you reverse the orientation. Uh, for each pair, you reverse the orientation of one of the two. And then you stitch this end to that end, this end to that end, this end to that end, and so on. So you're using essentially all the operations I had there before. And, uh, there is, and, and at the end, you get a single one component tangle, which in fact, if you can complete on the outside, will become a single knot. And in fact, clearly, this knot is the boundary of a surface of genus 2. Right? It's visible. The surface of genus 2 is seen here. It's, ma it's made of this rectangle here, along with a band here, and a band here, and a band here, and a band here, and the bands could be knotted with each other. So clearly, the knot you got here is a, a genus 2 surface, or maybe less than genus 2, maybe coincidentally, it, it, some, of it, some of it cancels. Uh, uh, and the claim is that every knot of genus less than or equal to can be obtained in this way. So basically, the genus is definable in terms of the operations I mentioned before. And so if you have an invariant that is well behaved under these operations, it may say, say something about the genus. So that's a reason to look for such invariants. OK. Uh, here is, a, 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 is so far everything OK? OK. So here is a more uh, a fancier example, which actually might resolve an open problem. So uh, it's, in some sense, even more motivating. So uh, I first have to give you two definitions. Definition one, a ribbon knot is a knot that can be presented as a boundary of a disk, which is immersed into R3, not embedded. So it is allowed to have some singularities, but the only singularities it is allowed to have are ribbon singularities. Ribbon singularities are singularities that look like in the picture here. So here the knot is in red, Parts of the disk that whose boundary are the, is the knot are, are, are in blue. So this is this bluish membrane. And this bluish membrane can intersect itself and can intersect the knot. And one intersection line is shown there in, in red. And this type of singularity is allowed. However, clasp singularities, which look like this, are not allowed. And if you want the difference, the difference is that um, over there, well, you see, every singular line has two pre-images in the parameter disk. Okay? So in a, a ribbon singularity, these two pre-images, well, uh, one goes from edge to edge, and the other is completely internal. In a ribbon single, in a sorry, in a clasp singularity, uh, these two pre-images, well, one goes from the edge to the interior, and the other one goes also from the edge to the interior. So this is not allowed. This is allowed. Okay. An example of a ribbon knot is shown here. Okay. Okay. So that's first definition. Second definition: a slice knot is a knot in. Well, usually we say R3, but R3 and S3 are the same from the perspective of knot theory, just one point removed. So it's a knot in S3, and you can consider S3 as the boundary of a four-dimensional ball. And, uh, and the knot is slice if it is the boundary of a non-singular, I forgot the word, smooth, uh, disk in R4. So if you can place a, a in B4. 
So you, if you can place a, a two-dimensional disk inside the ball, such that the boundary will be the knot. It's easy to show that every slice knot is ribbon. So I claim that this knot is ribbon. Sorry, is slice. It's clearly ribbon, but it's easy to show that it's also slice. Proof, well, all you have to do is to take the, uh, so the other room had the advantage that it had a pointer, and here I only have the laser pointer, which I really hate. But anyway, uh, so, um, so you take the blue membrane here, and you push it into the four ball. And you push it deep into the four, four ball, where the depth is proportional to the distance from the boundary. And then it is clear, well, maybe we should look at it here, it is clear that sort of the, 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 the left-right band can be pushed further than the vertical band, and then this intersection line, the green intersection line, disappears in R4. Okay? So therefore, a ribbon knot can be, can be shown to be slice. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, a class singularity cannot be eliminated in this way. Um, and then the open problem is whether it's an if and only if. And in fact, the standard wisdom is that it is not. So the standard conjecture is that there are slice knots that are not ribbon. But we don't know it. Okay? Maybe as an aside, there is something called the Alexander polynomial. And the Alexander polynomial can be proven to have the following property. So the Alexander polynomial of a ribbon knot is always of the form, the polynomial is a Laurent polynomial, and the Alexander polynomial at t can always be written, if the knot is ribbon, as f of t times f of 1 minus t. Sorry, uh, 1 over t. Uh, so suppose you had a candidate for a counterexample for uh, the ribbon slice conjecture. So suppose you had a knot which you knew is sliced by explicitly displaying a, 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 a disk whose boundary is that knot, and you wanted to show that it is not a ribbon. How, do, how would you show that it's not a ribbon? How would you show that there isn't such a blue membrane? Well, it's very hard. So instead, maybe you would use the fox muller theorem and say, let's compute the Alexander polynomial of that knot. If it is not of that form, the knot is not ribbon, and we found the counterexample. So that's the strategy for the proof. Unfortunately, it fails because this fox muller theorem also holds for slice knots. But the idea is to look for better invariants that will have a similar property for ribbon knots, but not for slice. Okay. Now, uh, okay. So, okay. I, you know, I told you about uh, the operations that I, I allow. I told you that the genus property is definable. I told you about ribbon knots, and now what I want to tell you is that ribbon knots are also definable. Uh, using my operations. And therefore, if I found a good invariant, it would potentially lead to a, a way of detecting non-ribbon knots, which might lead to a solution of this conjecture. So, uh, theorem, a knot K is ribbon if and only if it is kappa T of a tangle T for which tau T is the untangle U. Let me explain. If you have a tangle with two n components, so here are the two n components, one, two, three, four, n is equal to two. The tangle is lying here, and of course things can be and should be very much messed up deep inside. The tau closure of this, of this tangle is obtained by stitching one to two and stitching two to three, sorry, three to four, and the result is a two-component tangle. The kappa closure is obtained by stitching in a similar way at the bottom, and also stitching at the top, but with a shift of one. 
So this is a one component tangle, namely it's a knot. And the claim is that a knot is ribbon, if and so a knot K is ribbon, if and only if it can be represented as kappa of a tangle whose tau is the untangle. What does it mean to be the untangle? It means basically that each such, uh, well basically to be unknotted, can be re resolved, okay? Which really means that each of these, uh, not U-shaped, it's upside down U-shapes, should bound a half disk. And this half disk should be embedded and disjoint from each other, okay? Uh, example, I believe uh, this tangle here is an example. <clears throat> so if you close it at the top, it's, you, you can visually see that it's the untangle, right? Basically, this sort of slurps in and this slurps in and after that, more things basically collapse and the whole thing is, is the untangle. Uh, so therefore, by the theorem, if you close it at the bottom, but also over here, the result should be a ribbon knot. And, uh, uh, and in fact, it is the ribbon knot uh, shown here, though that's a bit hard to see. Uh, so I wonder if I should go ahead and prove this theorem. Maybe I'll prove one side of the theorem, and then the easy side, and then give an example of invar an invariant that realizes all of this. Okay? Uh, unfortunately, not the one we want, but, but, but still a, a good invariant. So, um, uh, how do I do that? Sorry, I didn't have time to, to, to make a fancy uh, 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 handout, so here's the non-fancy. So here is the easy, uh, here is the easy direction of the proof. So suppose you have a tangle whose top closure is the untangle. What does it mean? It means that, you know, this uh, pie shape, what's the upside down U? What? Cap. Oh, I guess. So this cap shape bounds a half disk, and this half, half, uh, this this uh, cap shape also bounds a half disk. Okay. But you see, when I say that it's trivial, I mean it's trivial in the entire upper half space. So those two half disks could be. It, re, when you actually realize them, uh, they can go, you know, they can go above, parts of them can go above the picture, like hockey, you know, where the players can go behind the goal. So, sort of, it's a Canadian, Canadian picture. So, so, so those discs can go, can go behind those nets, okay? Uh, but still, that would be an untangle. And then, uh, to get from the kappa, sorry, from the tau closure to the kappa closure, you need to do two things. One is you need to add a line from here to here and do surgery along these lines. So basically replace this, so cut two intervals open here and add two intervals parallel to that line. But you see, sorry, and you need to add two cups at the bottom, like I did over here, okay? This visibly bounds a disk, but this disk has singularities, because parts of the two disks that you had here went behind the goal. So basically, uh, this, so basically the line I added here, so this band here, could intersect those disks those parts of the, of the two lobes here. Uh, but these intersections are ribbon intersections, clearly, right? Basically, it's a small band, that narrow band, piercing through like these big disks that, that, that 
the bubbles that, whose boundaries are, are, are these two lobes. Okay? So I have proven one side, and the other side is proven below uh, with, with most of the details missing. Uh, but uh, I, I think it should be at least reasonable that the theorem is, is true. Are you with me? Are you okay? Maybe at the end, if you want, I will go back and prove the other side. Anyway, let's go back to the main uh, thread. Okay. Okay. So now, suppose you had an invariant which takes tangles on n strands to some algebraic space called A sub n. What do I mean by A sub n? I mean, well, something that people in algebra knows how to work with. Polynomials, n by n matrices, something. Okay? And suppose the invariant had the properties so, okay, sorry, so it would also take tangles on 2n strands to some space A2n, and it would take tangles with one strand, so T1, into some algebraic space A sub 1, and suppose it was well behaved under all the operations that I listed before, but you see, tau and kappa are compositions of the stitching operations that I listed before, so it would also be well behaved under kappa and tau, which means that corresponding to the topological tau that goes from T to N to Tn, there will be an algebraic tau that goes from A to N to An. So matrices, 2n two, two by 2n matrices to n by n matrices, or something like that. And likewise, there would be an algebraic kappa going from A to N to A1. Okay? And then the theorem, the topological theorem above, means that uh, a ribbon knot, so ribbon knots here, are the push forward under kappa of the inverse image under tau of the unknot. And you can check that it means that the invariant Z will take any such ribbon knot to a knot that belongs to the space R, where R is the inverse image under tau of 1. Let's declare that the invariant of the untangle is called 1. Okay? So tau is, so, so where R is the, is the push forward under kappa, the algebraic kappa, of the inverse image under the algebraic tau of 1. If you are lucky, then, so you need luck here. You don't need just you know, it's not enough to have a good invariant, well-behaved invariant, you also need to be lucky. If you are lucky, R is smaller than the total space, so R is a genuine subspace of A1, and then if you have a potential counterexample for the ribbon slice con con conjecture, you feed it into Z, if it comes out outside of R, you know it's not a ribbon and you win. Okay, so that's the dream. So here is a little bit of an obstruction for the dream. Two obstructions, okay? Or maybe, let's call it, let's say it differently. These are not obstruction to the dream. These are further requirements that you need for your invariant to work, for, for, for this dream to work, okay? So first of all, the smallest potential counterexample we know of for the ribbon slice conjecture is this knot shown here, which was discovered by Gomp, Sharman, and Thompson. And they explicitly show that it's a slice knot. They just exhibit, uh, or, or maybe not so directly, but, but, but they essentially exhibit a, 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 to a disk in the four ball whose boundary is this but they don't know if it is ribbon or not. So that's the, near, the smallest potential counterexample. The bad news is that it's big. It has 48 crossings. Most not invariants are computable in exponential time. Okay, so if you wanted to compute 
any one of the standard not invariants on a knot with 48 crossings, it would be very, 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 very hard. Okay? So a further requirement is that the computation of Z should be so fast, maybe polynomial time, so that uh, you might be able to compute it on the candidate knots that you have. So that's the faster is better here. And linear is meaner, and let me explain. So suppose, I mean, you can expect that the rank, the dimension, the size, whatever, of the space AN will grow as a function of N. Okay? So if it grows, if the growth rate of AN as a function of N is very rapid, then you can just sort of uh, estimate dimensions or sizes and basically, uh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm confused now. So uh, you take a, a, a co-dimension AN, co-dimension dimension, uh, co equal to the dimension of AN subset of A2N, that will be a very big subset and project it to a very small space, and likely it will be surjective. So likely, R will be the whole thing. So for the strategy to work, the size of AN as a function of N should grow relatively slow, slowly. And that's what I mean by linear is meaner. Okay? So these are further requirements. Okay. I, I, is it still okay? Am I, how am I doing on time? I, I think I'm fine, but I started late. Okay. Uh, so here's the gold standard. Okay? Again, sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry. People here might have seen it a long time ago because this is really old stuff. But anyway, uh, the gold standard is an invariant that satisfies all of the requirements. And Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Uh, so we want more like it. Okay? So uh, it's called gamma calculus. And it's actually, you can see it as fancy ways to compute the Alexander polynomial. So it goes as follows. So suppose you have an S component tangle. S is a finite set. And when I say S component, I mean that the component of the tangles are labeled by the element of the set S. Then the, the tangle T will have an invariant, gamma of T, which will be valued in the following space. So really, this is the space A sub S, or A sub N from before. Okay? That space, well, okay, first of all, uh, consider the ring of Laurent polynomial, sorry, of rational functions in variables T sub A, where, so in one variable for each component of the tangle. So basically I want rational functions in variables uh, corresponding to the components of the tangle. And then the invariant takes values in the ring R sub S cross, not tensor product, set theoretic product, uh, S by S matrices, so matrices whose rows and columns are labeled by the elements of S, um, uh, uh, with, with, with entries in that ring, so with entries rational functions. That's where the values of the invariants are. Uh, the, the, the best way, or one good way to display such a matrix, or such a, a gamma, the value of an invariant is when you make a row with entries, the, 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 the element, the, the labels, so basically with S, you make a column with S, and then these rows and columns label the matrix A, which is a ma the, ma the matrix part here, but then you have the upper left corner and you don't know what to do with it, uh, so you put the scalar over there. Okay, but th this doesn't have any meaning. This is just a way of displaying the information. Okay? So, I claim that there is such an invariant with values in this space. 
Well, uh, as I said before, in order to, to define this invariant, all I need, in order to specify this invariant, all I need is to tell you what are its values on the overcrossing and undercrossing, and how it behaves under disjoint union and stitching. Here it is. So, on the overcrossing <coughs> with over sorry, on the positive crossing with over strand A and under strand B, or on the negative crossing with over strand A and under strand B, the values of the invariants are so the scalar part is one, and the matrix part is this ugly matrix written here. And the sign, it's some, some, you get the, the variable corresponding to the overcrossing with sign corresponding to the sign of the with power corresponding to the sign of the crossing. Okay? You don't have to understand, it's a decree. Okay? There's nothing to understand. Okay. Suppose you have the disjoint union of two tangles, how does the invariance behave? So the invariant of T1 will be a pair omega 1 matrix A1. The invariant of T2 will be omega 2 matrix A2. And the resulting in the invariant of the disjoint union, well, you multiply the scalar part and take the diagonal direct sum of the matrices. And finally, the only interesting bit is how stitching acts. So suppose you have a knot sorry, not a knot, a tangle, with two special components, A and B, which you're about to stitch, and then N minus two further components, which I will call S. So S is really a list of further things. So uh, the invariant of this tangle will be a scalar omega, along with a, well, matrix like this, but in this matrix, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are scalars. So scalars really mean rational functions in those, all of those variables. And theta, since, since S is a row of things, theta is a row of things with n minus two entries. And you can tell it's a row because it has a horizontal line in the middle. And epsilon likewise has a horizontal line and phi is a column of further things, and psi is a column of further things, and uppercase psi is a big block of n minus 2 by n minus 2 things. And now I need to tell you how stitching acts on this. So stitching does the following things. First of all, it identifies the variables ta and tb and calls the result tc. So now you, you got read of the two variables that no longer appear, and a new variable got created, the new name of the new strand, okay? And then you replace omega by one minus beta times omega, which makes sense because beta is a scalar. You replace, or uh, the C by C entry will be gamma plus alpha delta divided by one minus beta, and so on for everything else, and if you look at it, everything makes sense. So here you have a scalar times a row, here you have a scalar times a column, here you have a column times a row, which really means a box. Right? I mean, if it was, it's not the inner product, it's the opposite of the inner product. So this is really a box, so everything makes sense, and the claim, by decree, this is how the invariant behaves. You will have to believe me that it actually works. In fact, you will not have to believe me, you just have to wait. Okay? So the claim, so, so let me say a few things about this invariant. First of all, for long knots, so if you have a knot with just one component, then the invariant, so I mean this will be just one entry, so the matrix part will be one by one, and it will turn out to be stupid, not interesting. However, omega, the scalar, will be the Alexander polynomial of this of, of the of the of the invariant of the um, of that non knot And in fact, it turns out by chance that this is the best algorithm I'm aware of to compute the Alexander polynomial. So, and, and the reason is basically because if you have a big tangle, you can cut it in half and compute something, sorry, a big knot. You can cut it in half, compute something for one half, then compute something for the other half, and that takes a lot less time because these are smaller things. 
And then the assembly is relatively cheap using these operations, even though it doesn't, it, it's not a priori obvious, but still it is. So in fact, uh, Nathan Dunfield uh, has used this algorithm to compute um, you know, the Alexander polynomials of knots with a thousand and up crossings, and it beats other algorithms by a factor of square root of a thousand which is about 30, okay? Um, good. Oh, and I should say that this invariant is also well behaved with respect to the other operations. So I will not do it in detail, but basically there is a formula for the delta operation. I don't know what the Q is doing here. I do know, but I, it's, an, it's a mistake in this context. So, uh, so this is how the invariant behaves under delta, and this is how it behaves under S, and also uppercase T should be lowercase T, I apologize. Okay? And again, I will not prove anything. And, and I should say, okay, this invariant realizes the dreams. So, first of all, since I have formulas for how the invariant behaves under whatever I want, in principle, I might be able to get bounds on the genus, or I might be able to use it to bound the genus of a knot. And in fact, you, I can, and you get genus bounds, which, which in fact were well known from 50 years ago, uh, the same genus bounds that one usually gets from the Alexander polynomial, but it also works from this strategy, which is good news because I plan to apply this strategy elsewhere. Okay? And uh, furthermore, uh, my uh, PhD student, Juan Vo, uh, had proven the Fox Milner theorem for ribbon knots using this technology. So everything, so, so the things you want actually work. Uh, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, maybe very, very quickly, I'll tell you that it's actually very, very easy to, act, to implement, to write computer programs that implement this invariant. And uh, in fact, here is the full program. And basically, you can see that the formulas here are close to the here. These formulas are essentially the formulas that before I wrote like a mathematician and now I'm writing them like it's computer code. Uh, once you have computer programs, you can just verify by brute force that meta-associativity holds, that the Riedemeister 3 relation holds, and therefore it's a knot invariant, a tangle invariant. And furthermore, if you want to compute it for any given knot, you simply enter the knot, hit enter, and you get the results and you even get them printed in the format you wanted. And I'm, I'm really out of time, so I'll end with, with just uh, uh, several uh, facts and speculations. So, uh, first of all, this particular invariant is actually better viewed as an invariant of two-dimensional knotted objects in R4. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you much about it, but I'll tell you that it's very closely related to my work with Zuzana sitting over there. And another fact is that this invariant is the zero loop part, whatever that means, of an n loop invariant, which, with luck, I will be able to explain later in my two months here. And the final speculation is the following. So, you know, nowadays it's very hard to give a talk about knot theory without mentioning categorification. Uh, so uh, uh, everybody wants to know if you can categorify anything you see. So uh, the, the Alexander polynomial is actually, so the Alexander polynomial in some sense has been categorif categorified, but that uses analysis. The algebraic categorifications are very, very messy. They are derived from the analysis and they're not algebraically motivated. And part of the reason is because um, the Alexander polynomial is usually defined as a determinant, and nobody knows how to categorify determinants. And in fact, when you compute determinants, they so basically 
you know, you do Gaussian elimination, row reduction, I don't know how you compute the term, but whatever it is that you do, you completely lose the topological meanings. So along the way, you get various matrices that have no meaning. And so you don't have any idea how to categorify, why it should be categorifiable, maybe it shouldn't be. So the advantage, so a further advantage of this approach is that it subdivides the computation, you know, instead of going from here to here by a huge leap, uh, 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 just which goes via compute the determinant, it subdivides it into, it makes many, many, many stepping stones. And in each step, so uh, going from each stepping stone to the next, all you do is uh, a bunch of essentially row and column operations. And the things you see along the way have a meaning. The things you see along the way are not random matrices. They are the invariant of specific tangles. So if anybody ever wanted to categorify the Alexander polynomial, the dream would be that you would be categorifying it in a meaningful way, in a way that will also be well behaved with respect to all of these operations. So the speculation is that this will give you stepping stone for how to categorify uh, the Alexander polynomial. I'm definitely out of time. I'll stop with my usual propaganda. for the Alexander polynomial, because yes. the fox minor theorem also holds for slice knots, for other reasons. OK? Uh, but you, but I, I thought the hope was that this invariant. No, not this invariant. This is the model. This is the model with, from, OK? So this is made, OK, this is the zero loop. This is the. This is the background. This is what I knew 10 years ago. Not quite, OK? But I mean, uh, the hope is to find more invariants. So, so, so the reason why this doesn't work is this uh, sort of small uh, footprint thing here. There is the Alexander polynomial for ribbon knots has a special form, which, roughly, which is roughly parallel to saying that the subspace R here is a genuine subset. OK? Uh, but, but unfortunately, the same theorem also holds for slice knots, so it's not going to work. But, but, but the hope is that we'll find more invariants that are well behaved under all of these properties, and that are fast to compute, and that are lean, and, uh, and you'll get more. And, and then maybe things will work. So in particular, this uh, potential counterexample yeah. ends up in R. And ends, out, ends up outside of R. Outside of R. I mean, that's, that's, that's the dream. But, OK, but where the is the dream standing? I have invariants that are fast, lean, stronger than the Alexander polynomial, well behaved under all of these operations. I, in fact, even have computed the value of this knot. But I could not yet analyze what R is. This is a hard algebra problem to figure out the push forward of a pullback. I haven't figured it out yet. So maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. Uh, you know, I must give you an incentive to invite me a few years from now, right? Other questions? Yeah. Um, I really think about frame tangles up to isotopy. Or you think about your tangles as being fixed and not up to isotope at all? Yeah, everything is framed. Okay. That's part of the lies that I was telling. Uh, so you see, if, if things weren't framed, then this uh, doubling operation, actually, I think it's probably best to scroll. So this doubling operation depends on having a framing. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And in fact, the sketch is right. The spirit is right, but I lied in minor detail. Um, could this help you with um, cabling formulas for the Alexander polynomial? This gives you a cabling formula for the Alexander polynomial. But does it give you cabling formulas where the framing is not zero? 
say I want yeah, to... Yeah, you can always do it. Yeah, there is also a formula for how to change frame. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Other questions? I mean, that doesn't mean, by the way, that if you will put me to the wall and ask me what is the formula, I will be able to tell you. I mean, I know the formulas are there. I, it doesn't mean that I'm, the algebra is right on my fingers.